Uh, in this segment, I'd like to provide a brief description of one form of process automation that's becoming more prevalent in process improvement work, and it's called robotic process automation, or RPA. Mainly, we're talking about the back offices of companies, not so much the factory floor. And what's going on in these back offices is a lot of people's time is tied up in very repetitive and laborious work in dealing with legacy computer systems. And uh, a number of consultants have described what RPA does is taking the robot out of people, which I think is actually a pretty good phrase. What that is referring to is this laborious repetitive work is the result of very defined rule-based uh, systems. These are systems, high volume usually, where there's a computer program that's presenting to the person a set of outputs on the screen, typically. And the classic situation is the chair swivel, where very often, literally, they are working on one terminal with system one, taking some data that they're seeing on the screen here and literally swiveling the chair to a second terminal and transcribing and re-entering certain data into different fields of this second program. And the reason they're doing that is over time, software applications have arisen in companies and not been connected. They've not been connected in some cases because this piece of software came first and much later this software was developed, perhaps by different departments, who knows, but they were not connected. And it was deemed just cheaper to hire people who would just do this chair swivel. And the amount of benefit in automating that in the past was A, very little, a bit of someone's time, but the cost of getting IT to do that was tremendous. And those resources were very scarce and they usually had other things to do in a company other than trying to connect these two systems. So you had a lot of this uh, use of people for very repetitive, laborious tasks. What the RPA tools allow now is business process users who are not fluent in programming, they're able to create these bots with off-the-shelf tools that allow them to go through all the instances, all the rules that a person now follows in, in working this chair swivel action and capture those rules in the form of a non-programming um, library, if you will. And so, for example, it would be when you're working on this application and in this case you see this information being presented in this field, it's telling the, the bot in a virtual sense to read that field and then to populate this field of this second software application. No longer requiring now a human being to do that, it's doing it virtually. So that's one um, attractive aspect of this new RPA approach is programming uh, knowledge is not required by the business um, process users. Secondly is they're not getting into the underlying systems. They are working at the presentation or user interface level, literally saying what's on this screen here in this field, let's put it in that field there, not going any deeper than that presentation level usually, which tends to lessen the sophistication of what you're doing and hence the cost, but also generally tends to reduce the risk of, of uh, inadvertently uh, messing up the underlying systems. It still can be a danger, but much less so. These RPA uh, packages usually have pretty robust control systems. By that I mean there's author controls, user controls, um, version controls, um, methods to collect the data on, on compliance. There might be certain things that have to always be done by the machine or by people and you can collect the data in a log that you can present to regulators and so forth. Um, occasionally human intervention is still required. Sometimes messy unstructured uh, information like handwritten notes maybe 
have to be um, uh, taken by a human being and then interpreted and entered into the system. So you might have a few cases like that, or you might have the rules taking care of 99% you know, of the situations, but the odd case gets kicked out for a person to take a look at and make a decision on. So there's sometimes some human intervention required, but the idea is to have the amount of time spent by people on this much, much less. A couple of watch outs. Um, there's the phrase, don't automate a broken process. And by that, we mean system one over here. Um, it's presuming that the information here is accurate and complete. If it isn't, if there's errors and defects in the system, if you automate it, it'll just be an automation of the propagation of that error to system two. So it presumes that it's clean here in system one, which means you need to be very rigorous and working all the way upstream to make sure that the rate of defects is low or none. Otherwise, you're simply uh, have a high speed propagation of defects. The second thing I think is even more important though is to be strategic about this. So a department could use RPA to save some time and, and drudgery in its area. But all they've done really is improve their piece of the process. Better yet is to be more strategic and look at important end-to-end -end customer value streams and then to very systematically improve that end-to-end -end and use RPA as one tool to do that, but not just in one part of the process, but really looking at the whole end-to-end -end customer value stream. But RPA is a very powerful uh, tool now for process improvement with a couple of caveats and watch-outs.